Hello, everybody, and welcome to Get Ready for the Answer. I'm Bobby Osinski, and I'm here to give you the answer to almost any business question, music business question, recording, mixing, anything like that. I'm here for you. So uh, just in case you don't know who I am already, you might know me from some of my blogs. Every day, there's, um, well, nearly every day, there's a blog post. And um, also from Forbes as well. And also on my Inner Circle podcasts. Uh, These all have gotten high ratings. So uh, check them out if you're not aware. You also might know me from my books. Boy, there's a lot of them out there. And um, these are some of the latest ones. You can get them on Amazon. You might know me from my courses. And there's some very, very cool ones. So I hope you check them out. But anyway, let's get to it. First thing, um, oh, here we go. Ah, If you have any questions, ask them in the comments, and I'll be sure to get to them. In the meantime, there's a whole bunch of questions that were sent in. So we're going to get to those now. First of all, let me just put something up here. Oh, wrong one. Looking for the right one here. The right scene, as they would call it here. Okay, let's go to the very, very first one. First question. Hang on, let me... Get rid of that. All right. From Mino Yom. Is it necessary to use a speaker base roll-off, such as minus 4 dB or minus 6 dB? No. You know what that's for, Mino, is if your speakers are up against the wall, I mean right up against the wall, then there'll be some bass buildup as the low frequencies bounce off the wall. So that's what that's there for, to compensate. The other thing might be if your speakers are in the corner of a room, which again, that's kind of the worst case scenario, and you'll have lots of bass buildup, and those roll-offs are a way to get around that. So that's what you have to look for in those cases. But other than that, you don't need them. And hopefully you're placing your speakers, you know, 12 inches, 18 inches, away from the wall. It's going to sound a lot better if you do that. Hey, Rob, from Northern California. Glad that you're here. Marshall. Yeah, I'm well. Hope you are too. Once again, if you have any questions, put them over on the right, and I'm happy to get to them. So let's get to another question here. From Earl McLean, some tips to recording vocals on the road, Uh, set up and considerations, and remotely recording, mixing with program material. I'm not sure what you mean with that second question, but the first one, the biggest thing when recording vocals on the road, I think you probably mean in hotel rooms and stuff like that, uh, is you need it quiet. So you need the quietest space possible. So there's two things involved here. The first one is it has to be quiet so there's no outside noise coming in, but you want to make sure that you don't disturb anybody else. And sometimes that's the hard one, especially with the vocalists. It's really, if you're getting a great performance in the vocalist, they're loud. So those are the two things you have to worry about. Sometimes a closet can help. It doesn't sound great, but uh, sometimes it can help with that. And then the third thing would be that, you know, you have a really good signal path. These days, it's easier to actually bring a signal path with you on the road that's pretty high quality. So that's less of a problem than it used to be in the past. In the past, we used to put together what we call fly packs. A fly pack was, you know, basically a road case with a bunch of recording gear. So uh, we don't quite need those big road cases anymore. We can pretty much get by with a whole lot less and it will sound really good. But, you know, it's mostly acoustics. The other thing is a good sounding room. 
Uh, uh, you don't want to be in a room. Most hotel rooms actually aren't all that bad. But, you, you know, you wouldn't want to record in a bathroom, <laughs> for instance, where it's really boingy or any kind of room that's really boingy. So that's the other thing to think about. Boy, lots of good questions coming in. And get to them just a second. Got a couple more here. From Mark Mager. When recording a solo artist with acoustic guitar and vocal track, I have difficulty with balance. It seems if I tune up the vocal track to get it out in front of the mix, it squashes the acoustic guitar. Well, that's probably because you have lots of leakage. So when you do what you have to do on the vocal, then what's going to happen is it's going to affect the sound of the acoustic as well. So, you know, the way around that, there's two ways. You, you do them separately, the, the acoustic guitar first and then the, the vocals. That's the cleanest way. Obviously, the second thing is if you can't do that, then you need to get some mics that give you the greatest rejection. And that would be some, you know, a couple of figure eight mics. At least one on the vocal will give you, a, and then you set the null point where it's looking at the acoustic guitar. And that won't solve your problem completely, but it will help it out a bunch. So that's what I would do. You know, get get those figure eights out. And another question that was sent in from Pat Autry. If I have high frequency hearing loss, is there a way to graphically confirm that I have made the mix too bright or tinny? Well, the, there's a good graphic way. Um, tonal balance from isotope will pretty much tell you if you're in the ballpark on the high end and the low end too. It's It, it actually works pretty well. So that's something I would check out. But usually you can tell by using the reference tracks. If you're using reference tracks, tracks that you know really well, then you know what the high end is supposed to sound like, and you just try to make your mixes sound like that. And that usually does it. I mean, we, we all, as we get older, we lose our high end. There's no question about it. But I don't find many of the classic mixers worrying about it at all. Because they they know how to compensate for the most part, so it it's rare where you have an older mixer that will send in something to mastering, for instance, and it'll be loaded with high frequencies. You know, they, you just if you do it enough and and you have stuff to compare it to, meaning um, mixes that you've done before or some really good reference tracks that you know so well, usually you know you just get in a ballpark from that. All right, let me get to your questions. This one from Mark. Hi, Mark. How do you EQ strings of FabFilter Pro QR? Pro QR is the reverb, if I'm not mistaken. If you're trying, um, isn't it? Anyway. If you're talking about the Fab Filter EQ, look, there, there's no one way to do this because it all depends on the arrangement. It depends how they're recorded, what strings they are. You know, there's you can't say, well, do this and do that. You don't know what they sound like. So for me to just say, well, you know, make sure there's 10K, lots of 10K, and and lose the 1K. No, I mean, you just don't know what it sounds like, so it's hard to say. What you have to do is make sure that when you put your strings in the mix, that you can hear the strings and you can hear all the other mix elements as well. If the strings tend to be, sometimes they get screechy, if they tend to get in the way of something else, then you have to go in and you have to EQ them, which means that you're going to have to find the frequencies that are rubbing the other mix elements the wrong way and then decrease them. So, and if you have strings that were recorded in such a way where maybe they don't have enough high end, then maybe you'll have to put some some top end on. But you don't know unless, until it, it's time to really put the mix together. So I can't give you a blanket statement on that at all. All I can say is they have to fit in the mix, and the only way is you have to sit there and you have to go, okay, and solo up the strings, solo up the, the vocals. Can I hear both of them? Is, is one covering up the other? Okay, so I have to 
EQ something to make sure that that doesn't happen. Oh, okay, now I go against the snare drum. Is that happening on the snare drum? Uh, and then solo up the strings against all the other instruments and see how, how it fits. That's why the, you know, mixing can take a long time because you're EQing a lot and you're round robin round robbing EQing. So I'm not going to tell you that the, the, you know, there's a right and wrong way to do it. You just have to, it, it depends too much on your arrangement, Mark. Oh, here's a good one. Hello, my friend. Thank you for sending in the um, testimonial video that you did. I appreciate it. Uh, about balancing kick bass snare at the VU meter, you insert the VU in the kick channel. No, no. You insert the VU meter on your, your mix bus. So the whole idea is the way we used to do it back in the analog days with the console, and it worked really well, is you take your kick drum, and it should go somewhere between minus 5, minus 7 on the VU meter. And take the snare drum, and it, and it should go somewhere in the same place. Then you get the bass, and you, you know, somewhere in the same place. And you can actually start to go, you can try with the lead vocal sometimes, that works, and... and all of a sudden, you'll find that you're in the ballpark. It's not perfect, but you're in the ballpark in terms of balances. Now, this only works on a, only works really well with the VU meter. I mean, it can work with other meters. With the peak meter, you're you know it's like minus fourteen or something in order to do it. But I mean, you, you could you could work it. You can make it work by just getting everything kind of in the same ballpark. But a VU meter, you'd put, um, if you don't have a v, VU meter, there's a lot of them that you can get for free, VU meter plugins. And that'll get you in a ballpark. Okay, from Marshall. I'm soldering some cables, XLR on one side, TRS on the other. Could these also substitute uh, direct boxes for instruments? Well, yeah, but here's the problem. And good for you for soldering your own cables. Not not enough people do that anymore. The amount of time I spent with the soldering iron, I can't can't tell you. I don't want to relive those years at all. It's funny because recently I found um, a uh, a cable out in my garage that was only half complete, and it was only an eight-channel snake. And I looked at it and I thought, do I want to spend the next couple hours soldering? No, <laughs> I just let it there. So um, anyway, uh, here's the here's what a direct bo direct box does. Direct direct box does more than anything. It there, there's in the passive ones. There's a transformer inside, and the transformer will take the low impedance and it will transform it into a higher impedance, so it matches better. And that means the frequency response will be better. And you don't get that if you just go TRS to XLR, for instance. The other thing that could happen with an active box is it could add some gain, too. And sometimes you need that with something that's, you know, really quiet. So, you know, it's, both, it's mostly the, this impedance match that you're getting. That's the important part with a direct box. Okay, Militia, hello. From Sweden. I read all your books. Well, thank you. Hope they help you. From William. Hello, William. Glad you're here. Oh, Marshall asks, in your opinion, what's the the best mix song ever well there's a lot of really great ones i listen to the uh, you know steely dan and, and most of the stuff that elliot shiner's done in the past has always been fantastic and elliot's been the longtime mixer for steely dan uh, e as well as the Eagles, and you can look at, at later Eagles records and even earlier ones, the same thing. They always sound really good and they're really 
wide and you can hear everything and there's so many layers and it's so big so one of the things that Elliot does you can have 120 tracks and he'll make sure you can hear every single one unlike other mixers myself included who will go in and will say well wait a second you got a lot of tracks and you don't need them all playing at the same time uh, Elliot kind of figures well if they're all there then they're supposed to be there and most of the clients he works with kind of intend it that way because he works only with the, you know, again, Steely Dan, Eagles. Uh, another one that I really like is from Donald Fagan, Morph the Cat. And Morph the Cat, the, the low end is magnificent on it. So he, that's, you know, another one. Um, I do like a lot of Bruce Fadine's mixes that he did with Michael Jackson. One of the problems, though, is there. there's not a lot of low end, not a lot of bass. It, it kind of rolls off at about 80. And it was just a product of, we weren't as crazy about low end when those records were made. And, and I had this conversation, actually, with uh, Ken Scott. And we talked about the Bowie records. I, I was just... Uh, sitting there in a mix room with him one day, and it was like, well, it, those Bowie records, they don't have a lot of low end. He says, we didn't care about it back then. He says, we couldn't hear it, so we didn't care about it. And and that's kind of the case. It was more in the mid-'80s we started to really think about the real low end. But those are, are you know, some of favorites that, that come to mind. But I have to admit, I do hear things all the time. Oh, um, I have to say that most of the things that uh, Manny Mariquin has done uh, have been fantastic. Uh, Charlie Puth, the Charlie Puth things, uh, has been, I mean, everything he's done has been magnificent. So you can look to him as, you know, just about everything. Um, not only in what you can hear, but very creative as well. I mean, you, you have some mixers that will just put everything together and it will sound good. You'll have others that will be really creative and will take it to another place. So that's the hard part, actually. Hello, Anne. Glad you're here. Okay, from Iran. Um, in which way do you think the true iron helps in the mix? How do you use it? I, I use it. I really like it, I have to say. I'm not one that generally likes saturation plugins or uh, especially tape saturation or anything like that. Uh, you know, I can make it sound good without it. But um, I do like True Iron. And what it does, it gives the mix some girth. That it, And it's very subtle. It's not something that, that really jumps out at you, but it's there. And you can notice it when it's... when you bypass it it gives the mix some girth and just some two some transformer roundness it really does work in my opinion it's one of my favorite plugins from Kazrog true iron it's not expensive either and not only that it will allow you to go to there's like six different transformers all from classic vintage instrument uh, classic vintage pieces of audio gear and you can go between them select whichever one sounds best plus you can overdrive the transformer and you know all sorts of things it, it's it's a really great plug-in but it, it's subtle Sergio hello Sergio what's your approach to, on reverb for backing vocals Well, generally speaking, back, background vocals want to be behind the lead vocalist. So that means that they're, they're usually going to have a little bit longer and a little bit more reverb just so they sit in the right place. So that, that's the, the, the first thing. Sometimes the way to make that happen would be to add a longer pre-delay and that would mean past 100 milliseconds and you'd be surprised that will give you some depth 
that you might not have had otherwise. So that's generally what I'll think of first to do that. I, th- there's a couple of things. The, the, with background vocals, the very first thing is, can I get it out of the way to lead vocal? If they're mono, for instance, then I would probably want to make them in stereo and move them off a little bit from the center. If they're already doubled, tripled, whatever, I want to make sure that they're off the center. So there's the lead vocal and, and the background vocal. So that's, and I don't mean pan wide, I mean just off a little bit. So there's a hole in the middle for the vocal. So that's the very first thing. Um, the second thing is, can I make them thicker? Do I have to make them thicker? And how can I do that? Mm, a couple ways to do it. The easiest way is to get a chorus or a light flange and try that and see if it makes them a little thicker and a little wider. Sometimes um, detuning, especially if there's like some tuning problems, you might want to get something that will, will fix, not necessarily fix the pitch, but will adjust the pitch. And the old harmonizer trick where there's, um, uh, you have two channels, one is tuned a little up and one is tuned a little down. And that usually eliminates that, makes the sound good. And then the third thing would be to push it back from the lead vocal. And of course, that's usually reverb. Sometimes delay, uh, uh, sometimes a nice delay will do that. Like uh, um, triplets are my favorite. A triplet delay and something that's more like, uh, depending on the tempo of the song, quarter or an eighth note delay. But I find that if it's around the 350 millisecond range, it tends to work better. So between three and 400 milliseconds, it tends to work really well for that. So, you know, that's so that's the first thing is move it away from the center, make it a little thicker and bigger, and then move it back. That's the... That would be the appro- general approach. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Okay, from Ann. I was wondering if I should use a DI when plugging a guitar bass into instrument input of my Focusrite solo interface when recording into my digital audio workstation. Um, you might not have to. Now, it depends. I, I'm... I'm not familiar with the Focusrite Solo, but I think it probably has a DI input. Uh, or Now, here's the thing. If you have a DI, I would experiment and see which one sounds better. So if you can plug directly into, into the interface, try that, see what it sounds like, and then do the, an identical take using your DI. Then the DI goes into a... a mic or a line input and see what which one sounds better because sometimes you'll be surprised sometimes you know you, you'll expect one to sound better than the other and it'll be just the opposite so that's what i would do it, it all depends on how good the interface is how good the di is hi chris love your mixing course oh very cool i'm glad you liked it when asked about compression on vocals, add compression often running in harsh S's and T's. Yeah, that happens. The vocal sounds fantastic. Otherwise, is there a way to tweak that in the compressor, or should I be using it to yes or yeah? You know, that's that's a byproduct. That's some something we all deal with. But uh, it's time for a deesser. And uh, deessers are tricky to set up, but they're tricky in that a lot of them just have one frequency that they work on. If you're lucky, there's one frequency that's jumping out. What I tend to find is, though, that it's two or three frequencies. And there may be something, you know, like 5 or 6K, and there may be something at 2 or 3K, and sometimes there may be something at 1K that's jumping out. You'd be surprised. So I've stopped using de uh, which would mean that you'd need multiple de to make it work. Uh, but I've stopped using them, and instead I use a dynamic EQ. And that way I, I have up to five bands if I want. And I find that, and also I can control the bandwidth, and I can control a lot better than, than sometimes with a de 
The one I tend to favor, well, there's two of them. There's, the one I tend to favor is the Waves F6 RTA, which is relatively inexpensive. I think it, you, you can find it for 29 bucks. Um, but what it will do is there's a real-time analyzer, so you can actually see where the peaks are. You can go in and you say, oh, right there. The other one will be the, uh, again, my favorite, which is the FabFilter Pro Q3. And it's a dynamic EQ as well. So you can go in and, and you can see the the waveform. You can see the, the, the spectrum analysis as well. So um, I think dynamic EQs work better for this. But if you don't have that and you only have um, de-esser, you might have to put it on twice because, again, it's usually more than one frequency that's happening, which is what I found. Uh, one of the things I like about the Sheps Omni Channel, for instance, uh, Andrew Sheps' great plug-in, is uh, he has a two-channel de on it. And he's found that, too. Okay, from Zed. You mix in a stereo bus compressor and EQ or tweak individual channels. Both said. Um, I'll usually start with at least one compressor. Now, usually the EQ comes at the end. The, you might want to put an EQ on your stereo bus, but usually it's only for just a little bit, a dB here and a dB there. And it's usually like a little bit in the low end, a little bit in the high end. That's it. But you don't put it on until you think you need it at the end. But uh, you're better off to mix into the bus compressor. So for me, that would be an SSL bus compressor. I, I can't find anything better. Um, many times I'll use a, a, a PSP vintage warmer. Not much of it, but I like the glue that it adds. So a combination of those two, and what I'll do is uh, start the mix through there, get it pretty well going, and then take take those out and see if it sounds better or not. And sometimes it does. So it's like, well, okay, we'll either try something else or we'll have to tweak it or whatever. Now, if you go too far in the mix, like towards the end, and then you decide to take those out, you'll find that your mix balance will be whacked. You'll, you won't have to start again, but it'll take you <laughs> some time to put it back together again. Usually the mid-range, the mid-range will, will get all whacked out. That's why, you know, if you, you kind of make that decision kind of midway through the mix and you're better off, I think. Um, I, I tell the story that last year I did an album that had nothing on the mix bus at all. A whole album and I tried really hard to use what I usually use and it just didn't sound better <laughs> you know so you have to trust your ears on that and say well sounds better without it then don't do it now that being said you can get by without a lot of that stuff if, if you're doing your individual channels well so that would mean that you know you, you're controlling everything really well and you'll find you won't have to use much on the mix bus at all. So, uh, and, and again, I, I don't think I ever use more than like 3 dB of compression. And, and hopefully it's less than that. The more you use, the, the kind of the worse it is. <laughs> because w what's going to happen is you're going to lose a lot of dynamic range and you have to worry about that. I mean, you want to keep some. If you have questions, put them in the comments, by the way. Happy to get to them all. From William, um, do you think that when we mix in a digital audio workstation, a meter view is better for everything? No, I don't. I think the peak meters that you usually have work much better. They, um, uh, the, the biggest thing is you don't want any overloads. And you can't tell when you have a a VU meter. That was the problem forever that we had in the analog world. 
So going back to the analog world, you'd have some engineers that'd be able to have these wonderful recordings and mixes. And you go, how do they do that? Well, it's because they knew how headroom worked. I'll give you big, uh, the biggest example I can think of. You're overdubbing a tambourine or a triangle, and you only have a VU emitter to work at. Well, if you, the, the problem is the transients are so fast that a VU meter doesn't pick them up. So they're anywhere between 10 and 20 dB hotter than what the VU meter is showing. So if you're actually recording at zero VU, this tambourine, you could be distorting this whole signal chain because it could be, it's probably, you know, at least plus 10, if not more. So that's why we found out, well, if you have a lot of high-frequency transient energy, then you have to go down to like minus 10 or minus 15, record down there. Now, with the peak meters that we have in digital audio workstations, you don't have to worry about that. I mean, you can see exactly what it is. So that's why it's better. There are times, like I was telling you before, where getting balances might be better using a VU meter, but eh, generally, no. You don't. It's not a good idea, I don't think. Again, if you think it's better, then maybe you should do it, but um, I I don't. Oh, and I'm very pleased. My mixes are improving. Very cool. Okay, from John. Thanks for sharing your experience and wisdom. Yeah, my pleasure, man. I've heard you talk about the song you use for referencing. Do you use uh, Wave or MPG for... Our MPEG formats uh, doesn't matter. CDs don't seem to have a format I can import in Studio One. You should be able to. I mean, CDs are, are nothing but uh, AIFF files for the most part. So, uh, you know, it shouldn't be a problem. Yes, you want the highest quality that you can get. So, you, you know, you don't want MP3s. You don't want anything like that. You don't want something off a stream unless it's a FLAC file, F-L-A-C, then that's okay. Um, you don't want, um, you just want the highest quality you can, you can get. I like to go to either Cobuz, Q-O-B-U-Z, or HD Tracks, it's another one that I can think of. There, there's four or five places where you can go and you can get 96K, 24-bit copies of the master of, all, of many of your favorite songs, especially the classic stuff is available. So then, you know, hard to get better than that. And it, it's a great reference point because you can hear lots of little subtleties that you certainly can't hear otherwise. So um, you should be able to import from a CD, though. CD is, is you know, that's reasonably good quality there. Um, it, you know, there, there used to be a way for most digital audio workstations just to import that. I, I can't believe that they don't have that anymore. Okay, for Mark, excuse my my ignorance. I put the EQ first, then the compression, which has improved the sound using Fab Filter. Okay, if you like it and it works, then do it that way. But here's the problem: this will work if you're only cutting on your EQ. Then you can put it first. That's not a problem. So cut all you want, but as soon as you begin to boost then you have a problem because say you're boosting a 2k well now the compressor is going to trigger off 2k because you boosted it may not be what you want you may not be getting the control you want may not be getting the sound you want as a result the other thing is mixing is dynamic 
So, especially with the EQ, we're always tweaking. We're going back and forth. Okay, put this in the mix. Wait, oh, it doesn't work with this. I have to tweak the EQ over here. And you're constantly tweaking EQs throughout the whole mix. If you have the EQ before the compressor, every time you tweak an EQ, the compressor's changing, so you have to tweak the compressor. So now you're doing twice the work. Usually, if you just set the compressor up, if it's first in the signal chain, you set that up, you don't have to change it after that. And you can, if the EQ is after in the signal chain, you can change the EQ all you want and you never have to go back to the compressor for the most part. So that's why you do it, that, those two reasons. However, if what you're doing works for you, then you should keep on doing that. Okay, from Zed, how quickly do you get basic balance together before you start tweaking the automation? Uh, usually you wait until the end, the very end, to do the automation. So you have all your balances up, you have all your EQ, the compression, everything is set. And then you go, you go and you start to do your final tweaks, final balances. And that's usually when you do it. The problem with starting with automation too early in the mix is too much changes. So that means your automation is changing as well. And it's a pain to change automation, generally speaking. I mean, it's another step that you, you're you doing that you don't have to. And uh, the, the thing about it, it, like volume changes, for instance. Oh, I just did the automation, but now the whole track is too, too soft. Well, yeah, you can go in, you can trim it up, but you know, why bother? Uh, you can just do it all at once if you wait until the end. So that would be all your automation moves. The 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 w exception to that would be, I'm talking about level automation. The exception would be mute automation. Well, you're going to do that right away because I know this is not going, I know this is going to be on, this channel is going to be on, and then I know it's going to be off for here. Then I know it's going to be on. Uh, well, you might as well do that right away. So it doesn't distract you in the mix. Uh, the other thing that might happen is if you have a big EQ automation. So, for instance, you have to EQ a word or a phrase. Well, yeah, you do that on on the fly while you're doing it. So, but usually the fader automation, you kind of wait until the end, especially things that, you know, you're writing faders and things like that. You know, you, you'll, you'll wait until the end. My pleasure, Sergio. Oh, your five day course. Yeah. Um, there's another one coming up. We'll be doing another one in September. So, um, probably in like four weeks, but I'll let you know when it happens. Uh, uh, that's a, a five day Facebook mixing workshop and I did one, uh, last month. We'll do another one coming up. Oh, Sergio, this is a good one. This is one I love. Biggest advice for a live sound engineer. Concentrate on, on the vocals first. Boy, you're going to get me off on a rant. I believe that there's a whole generation of live sound engineers that have learned the wrong way. And what they've learned is I'm going to concentrate on the kick and the snare first. And then they can't fit the vocal in, and the vocal's never loud enough. And the way I was taught was you go to the thing that's the quietest element on the stage, which is usually the vocal, and you concentrate on that. So, for instance, if, if there wasn't a vocal but there was a, a flautist, so I'm playing a flute, 
that's what you'd work on first. And you get that, and then you build a mix around it. And that way you always make sure that that you have a balance. But what I find is a lot of mix engineers spend so much time getting the kick and the snare sounding good, and then they overwhelm the vocal. So, uh, and when it comes down to it, you know, people care about the vocal. So that's my big advice. Oh, yeah, this is a good one, William. You talk about how to use frequencies around 20, 40, especially achieve the depth that you hear in cinema. Well, cinema is a different case. It's in most cinema, you have uh, um, 5.1, for instance. Most cinemas these days are 5.1, 6.1, 7.1, go on and on. But here's what the point one is. It's not a subwoofer channel. It's what they call a boom channel. It's a separate low-frequency channel. It's only for those low frequencies. And it's especially for earthquakes and explosions and stuff like that. It only goes from like 20 hertz to about 120. That's it. So th that, that's the point one of the 5.1 but it's specifically for those low frequencies and nothing else. Um, uh, just a, a story about that. So originally, 5.1 was five full range speakers and a subwoofer, but the, the only thing the, the subs did was they, they're only there for this boom channel, which only happened two or three times during a movie, if that. And my mentor in surround sound mixing was Tom Holman, Thomason Holman. If you've ever been to a a movie and it has THX, well that stands for Tom Holman Experiment. Tom came up with that. And his whole thing behind 5.1 was, uh, and he told me the way he came up with it, they were listening to dailies for um, the second Star Wars movie because he worked for Lucasfilm at the time. And they're doing the dailies for The Empire Strikes Back. And they had Jabba the Hutt, a scene with Jabba the Hutt. And Tom would listen to it on the stage, then take the audio home and listen to it at home, where he had subwoofers. And he'd go, well, why does it sound better at home than it does on the big stage with all the big speakers? And then he realized, well, we have these subwoofers, but we're not using them for anything except this boom channel. So it was his idea to use the subs as extensions, low frequency extensions for the main speakers, as well as the boom channel. So there's actually two different signals going into the subwoofer. There's a separate signal on a whole separate channel called the boom channel that's sending those low frequencies and explosions and stuff like that. Plus there's all the frequencies coming from the other five speakers, or at least the front three speakers going into the sub. So that's the, the whole idea behind 5.1 and 6.1, 7.1, 11.1, all those. That, that's the standard that we use today. Tom came up with it. Tom has been working for Apple. He's been the head of their audio, I think director of audio, for maybe 10 years now. Cool, Zed. Yeah, another one in September. Uh, I haven't determined the, the date, but I think, well, let's see. It should be about a month, exactly. Uh, no, I think it would probably be the, yeah, yeah, somewhere. Second week, I think. We'll do it. Okay, from Anne. I seem to have static white noise in my overheads, native instrument studio drummer, when the hi-hat is open. Regardless of any setting, I choose. Hmm. Hey, the recommendation is how to clean that frequency up without killing the overhead track. Well, I'm not sure what that is. It could be the way it was recorded. So if it's there, either choose to say, well, wait a second, I... 
I'm not hearing it because it's buried in the track. I'm he only hearing it when it's soloed or playing by itself. But when I listen to the rest of the mix, I, I don't hear it. So you live with it. And we do that a lot. I mean, there, there's... Through the years, the stuff that, that's been left on, especially in the old tape days, the stuff that was left on, it was just, you know, amazing. People grunting and, and, and talking between takes and, uh, you know, all sorts of things that were left on that you just don't hear because there's so much going on. So that's one way. Um, you can try a low-pass filter and start at 20K and start a move down. See if it gets rid of it. At a certain part, you'll start to change the sound of the overheads. But you might get rid of it. I mean, if it's really high up there and it's like 15K or something, you know, you could get rid of it using a low-pass filter. Try that. The other thing would be, let's see, let me just look. When the hi-hat is open, studio drum, the hi-hat is open regardless of the setting. See, I'm not sure when you say your overheads, is it the, the hi-hat or is the overheads? Re regardless, you know, you try those two things first. The first thing is, well, I live with it because I can't hear it in the track. The second thing would be, I'll try a, a low-pass filter. And I'll see if I can just gradually move it down and see if that gets rid of anything up there without me noticing. Um, a third option would be, you know, kind of a noise gate. And set the noise gate so it's it's just cutting that stuff off. And basically what will happen is when the hi-hat overheads are playing then you'll, uh, you won't hear that noise anyway because they're playing. And if there's noise happening when they're not playing, then that will be decreased. Those are the three things without hearing, hearing it. From Eric. Um, yes, David Blackmer, DBX. Yes, that's true. David Blackmere, uh, who is the brains behind DBX. He's the, the B behind DBX. It was um, DBX, the company. And I can remember when I lived in Boston, DBX was just getting started. And for a minute, I thought I was going to go work for, for them and, and didn't. It's probably a better idea, to be honest with you. But... Uh, yeah, they they had a better idea of how to do compressors than anybody else at the time. And it's still a way that, you know, the, there's something about the DBX 160s and 160Xs that really sounds terrific. Oh, well, very cool. I'm I'm glad, William. You think you make a great concert only with the Apollo UAD sound cards without a console, get a good sound? Yes. No, you can. As a matter of fact, there's a great engineer, Mark Lynette, and Mark has big time credits, like all the the Beach Boys stuff that's been reissued and all. And, you know, Mark's done all that, but he he made his living doing live recordings. And for a long time, all he had was, you know, really basic stuff. And he had a rack with some preamps and no console. I mean, I don't think he ever had a console. Now he, he has big trucks and stuff like that, so it's different. But um, he made some fine recordings during the 80s and 90s and early 2000s with, without, you know, a console. So I don't think you need it. I think you can do really well. Apollo sound really good. I'm using an Apollo Twin 2, <clears throat> Model 2 here. I had an Apollo Twin 1. 2 sounds a little better. But um, I've been very happy with it, and I also have some Apollo 8s around another rig. So uh, I'm very happy with the sound. They sound pretty good. So no, uh, it's not a crazy idea, and it's something that uh, you know you should go for because it, it will sound good. Now... Can you make it sound better with some outboard preamps? Yes. 
the onboard ones are, are good. They are. They're definitely useful. Um, do they sound as good as some dedicated outboard ones? No. But here's the difference. It's the difference between a $1, $2, $3 preamp that's built into your $5 even and a $100, $200, $300,000, preamp that's outboard. So you would expect that to sound better. So that that's that's the deal there. All right, I don't see any more questions. Ah, here we go. Yeah, man, my pleasure, always. Body man, the best techniques or plugins for DSing a harsh vocal. Well, yeah, you, you know, use the DSer. Well, the first thing is, if the vocal is harsh throughout the whole song, then it's EQ. If it only happens in sections, then a DSer or a dynamic EQ will work better. But if it's if it's throughout the whole song, then you want to find out what which frequencies those are and and duck them a little bit, attenuate them. Harshness usually comes 1 to 2,500, somewhere in there. And, um, and ducking them down a few dB might, might help. But if it's only in certain spaces, then you'd probably want a de -esser. Like I was saying before, I personally really like dynamic EQs, only because there's more control. And I've not used a de in quite some time, but I've used dynamic EQs. Sometimes, in, you know, two of them at the same time. So uh, it's usually like a Waves F6. And, and then if I, I still don't get what I need, then I'll put uh, a Fat Filter Pro Q3. But you can't go wrong with either one. It looks like it. Well... Let me just tell you then that uh, if you haven't done so already, sign up for my free mini course, Vocal Mixing Techniques. And what this is, is there's nine different techniques that you'll find. Nine different ones. And there are um, actually seven for mixing and two for recording that you'll find very useful. You just go to bobbyosinskycourses.com. You'll see it in the top. It's free. LA2 for de all the high frequencies. What are your thoughts about this technique? I don't know that technique. I'd like to find out what it is. I mean, you can do this if you had a side chain. Now, if the LA2 had... It was modified. It was a hardware LA2 modified with the side chain. Yeah, you, you could make it work. But without it, just a stock LA2, I don't see how you'd do that. Okay, from Mark. Where would you apply a multiband compressor? Well, not so much anymore. Multiband compressors have been somewhat replaced by dynamic EQs. And here's why. Multiband compressor, they have fixed bands. Now, you can control how how wide those bands are many times. Sometimes you can't. But you can't control the crossover frequency or, or, or the crossover, how steep the crossover is or anything like that. You can't control the Q or anything like that. A dynamic EQ, you, you know, you have infinite control, basically. So that's why it it works better in a multiband compressor. I can't remember the last time I used a multiband compressor. The other thing a multi -band compre about a multiband compressor is they're usually five bands. So people get the mistaken idea that they have to use all five bands. But it's usually just one or two that require any kind of compression. So it's it's rare that all five bands are going to be kicking. So it's something I think about. Yeah, man, glad to help. 
Um, Persona sound cards. I can't talk about their interface because I don't know much about that. I, th I, they should sound good. I can tell you that the consoles, the Studio Live, sound really good for what they are. I own one that's in a rehearsal studio, but we've done a fair amount of live recordings and everybody's always been impressed. So uh, I know uh, one person that's in my Hitmakers Club, sometimes he's here, Ozumaro, uh uses it for a lot of recordings and he loves the sound. But, uh, you know, again, I, they really do sound good. So this is the console. I believe that the same electronics are in the interfaces as well. So that should sound equally as good, but I haven't played with them, so I can't tell you about that. From Cole, uh, you discussed some uses for dy dynamic EQs. What are your thoughts on multiband compressors? Well, I think we just talked about that. More spe specifically, when might you decide to use one over the other? Uh, I I haven't used a multiband compressor in a few years, to be honest with you. I don't ever see a need to use it. Um, some people might disagree. Uh, now... If you've used a multiband compressor for a certain function and you like it, you like the way it sounds, you'll probably always go back to it. So I can see that. I never used them that much to begin with, but I've just found the multiband compressors to be so much more variable. I mean, you can do so much more with them. So that's why, and I have, you know, like the FabFilter uh, multiband EQ, which, or multiband compressor, which sounds great. But I much prefer the <laughs> the dynamic EQ. Um, no, I don't have that, and the technique is described in in my books. But uh, the mini course is only available with the other courses, uh, unfortunately. Th there's four things that you want to do primarily with with editing. One is you want to clean up all the noise before a clip and after the clip. So you go in, you, and, and it takes time. Everybody complains about this, that it takes time. Most of the big mixers will have an assistant that will do all this before they get to the mix. Otherwise, they'll spend a day doing it. Um, Hope this should have been done before it ever gets to a mixer, but many times it isn't. So the first thing that you'll do is go in and clean up everything that shouldn't be there. You delete it. Uh, grunts, noises, you know, noises on guitars, on electric guitars, are notorious for being there. Things like um, oh, breaths maybe in between vocals. Sometimes the you, you need them, and sometimes you don't, so you get rid of those. So that's the first thing. The second thing would be usually cleaning up any edits. And many times people will just do a, a, a butt edit, which can be okay, but sometimes they pop and they click, so you have to go in, you have to put a little fade in. So that's the second thing. The third thing would be um, getting rid of any pops of vocal plosives or glitches or things like that. So, you know, you go in and, and there's three or four different ways to do it, but you use one of the ways to get rid of those. And then the fourth thing would be to clean up the releases. All, of course, all the attacks and releases. The attacks most people get, it's the releases they don't, and that's what makes it sound tight. So, for instance, with vocals... Vocals, everybody knows, okay, we got to start on one. Everybody sings on one, and you should pretty much get it. And if not, you go and you, you align things. But it's how people release. It's when they stop singing. So luckily, we can help that. We just go in and, and we put fades in, so everything fades at the same place, and it sounds tight. So those are the four things you're going to be doing. Okay, from William, uh, if you were to do live sound again, can you mention 3PA sound systems? 
that we use. I, I, I can't. I, I just don't know. I haven't kept up with it, to be honest with you. And I have to say, it's passed me by a lot because I'm usually amazed at how different it is when I go and I see everything. At a concert, for instance. Oh, I'll, I'll, you know, I have to say, there is one system. Jeez, I forget what it is. I think it's a... Um, at the rehearsal studio that I was telling you about, I have my personas, and I think it's a personas um, system as well. Sound system. It sounded great, it's, but that's as far as I know. To use a fader controller from Zed, um, I have one, but I don't use it. I have a personas. I can't remember the last time I used it. Um, uh, honestly, I don't feel I need it. I can just draw it in just as easy. Draw the animation in or use a mouse. Oh, cool. Well, I'm glad I could. Had to step away and miss most of this, sadly. Will this video be available? Yeah. Yeah, you can watch it. It'll be available, Chris. Uh, you like the FabFilter multiband? No, I like the FabFilter Pro Q3. Uh, some of your other favorite dynamic EQs, well, the only other one I use is the Waves F6 RTA. And those are the two I use. I'm sure there's other real good ones, though, but those are the two I use. By the time editing is worth every minute spent, it makes the results so much better. Yeah, it does. Um... It, it, noise is cumulative. That's one of the things that people don't realize. So it, it may not seem like much on one track, but it adds up when you have a lot of them. So over 40 tracks, the, the noise can add up. And when you get rid of all that noise, everything sounds a lot cleaner, a lot better. Oh, William, I think I just mentioned that. I, I don't know. I don't have enough experience, so I can't really say. Um, that looks like it. Okay, everybody. Um, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate it. If you have any questions afterwards, you can get me here, questions at bobbylusinski.com. And there's a whole lot of free PDFs and eBooks and stuff like that. And just go here, bobbylusinski.com forward slash free hyphen resources and You'll see lots of stuff. There'll be uh, webinars that you can see, crash courses, and lots of cool ebooks. So until then, I will see you. Um, maybe we'll do this next week again. And uh, if we do, I'll let you know. Take care, everybody.